So the schedule for this class has us covering up through gravitation. And that's the last topic we're supposed to cover. And last week you covered gravitation. <laughs> so that leaves us, um, yeah, have a nice day. Uh, so, and we have three meetings more this, today, and there's two classes next week, and then, the, then there's the final. So we only have three more lectures. Um, so today, I'm just going to do a zillion example problems, okay? <laughs> or we are going to do them together. So this problem says, a uniform wire with mass m and length l is bent into a semicircle. Okay, so it's a semicircle, mass m and length l, length L, right? So L goes from here all the way out to here. <coughs> Find the magnitude and direction of a gravitational force this wire exerts on a point with mass little m placed at the center of the curvature of the semicircle. Okay, so we have a wire with mass total, total mass m, and we have a test mass here. And the question is, what is the gravitational force Find the magnitude and direction, basically find the vector, the force vector, on this guy from the Y. So first of all, if you have two, two point masses, what is the force between them? Right. G, M1, M2 over R squared, right? So it's proportional to this constant, right? And it's proportional to each mass and it's inversely proportional to the distance squared. Right? And what is this? This is just a number. How do we know this number, by the way? Other than it's in the textbook. That experiment, yeah. How do you, how do you measure this one? Yeah, it's like a... Yeah, you use a laser and two masses. Yeah, you have a... Well, first of all, why is this hard? Because gravity is such a weak force. Gravity is really weak, right? So you're looking for small effects. Unless you have massive objects. You could do experiments with two Earth-sized objects. It wouldn't be so hard. <laughs> but that is hard. So you have uh, something like this suspended, and this can rotate. And then you have a mass here to attract it. And you measure the attraction by the rotation of this, of this guy here, which you can measure by putting a mirror here and shining a laser and seeing where it hits a screen. It's a real, it's a pain in the butt. And the people who do this have to worry about things like, uh, is there a semi a mile away on the freeway that's shaking the ground? <laughs> because the size of those effects are larger than the size of the effects they're trying to measure. So it's all about controlling the uncertainties. Okay, so this is a force between two test masses, right? And we have one test mass from point mass, but we don't have another point mass. So how do we do it? What's that? Integrate, right? So let's chop this guy up into lots of little point masses, right? We'll call this dm, an infinitesimal slice of our loop, right? And then df is um, gm, and this is little m, integral dm over r squared, right? I'm oh, sorry, this is df, right? And then f is just the integral. Yeah. Okay, well, let's think about it. We're asked to find the magnitude and the direction. So let's think about it in x and in y. What can we say about x or y? What's going to be the, I mean, can you look at this and tell me what the direction is going to be? What about an x? All right, so there's going to be a force in x, right? Because all the mass is on one side of it. What about in y? It's zero, right, by symmetry. Why is it zero by symmetry? Because for any point here that's applying a positive force, there's an equal point here applying the opposite force, right? So there's no net force in the y direction on this guy. Everybody agree with that? OK. So that means we just have to worry about the x. So that's nice. All right? So force in the x direction is the integral of d of x. I like statements like this absolutely no content, but it feels sort of satisfying, right? Like, written down all this fancy notation actually said nothing. Um, you know, this is like the inner rule of the derivative is, you know, gives you nothing. Anyway, 
Uh, so here we have a constant, we have little m, right? And then we have dm over r squared, but we're only interested in the x component, so I'll throw in the cosine theta. Okay? And fy equals zero. Okay, so how do we do this integral? How do we integrate dm? And dm is cosine theta. We need to transform this dm into something we can integrate, right? We need to, well, r is constant, right? So we can pull this out. That's not a big deal. But this theta is not constant, right? Each little infinitesimal m is going to have a different theta, and they're going to contribute differently. Um, for example, over here, there's going to be no contribution to the force in x, right? Whereas over here, it's going to be larger. So we need to translate dm into something that reflects the cosine theta so we can do this integral, right? Um, and so we think about what dm is, right? And, and think about relating dm to d theta, right? Then we can write things like dm is... Right? Or I guess it's easier to think about it if you write it like this. Because the mass is uniformly along the wire, you can say that the fraction of the mass that's in dm, right, this is dm over the total mass, is the same as the fraction of the angle that's over the total, the total angle. Right? The total angle of the loop is pi, total mass is m. So this gives us dm is m over pi d theta, right? So I can put that in here, and now I have g m m over pi r squared, right? This r squared comes here, this pi comes from there, and now I have the integral d theta of cosine of theta, right? From from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, or the other way, it doesn't matter. Okay, so what's this integral? What's that? Sine theta. Sine theta, okay, and then evaluate it. One minus negative one. Believe me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it depends if you integrate from one direction to the other, right? But here, here we're just getting a magnitude of the force, we know the direction, so it doesn't really matter. Okay, so all right, this is that's fx. Um, yeah, so there's our answer, right? So we have, um, essentially this is g m m over r squared divided by pi over 2. And if you're really arrogant, you could say, oh, I could have looked at the structure of that and derived this, you know, just from the structure of the problem. But it's always easier once you've uh, once you've seen it. Okay, so this is a you know integration problem. You have contributions which vary along the length of the wire, and so you need to do the integral because it varies smoothly. And the trick to this problem, I mean the physics is here, right? And that's not so hard. The rest of it is really just math. There's a little bit of a tricky integration here in changing the dm into a d theta. Those are really the only two conceptual steps in this problem. Okay, uh, let's do another one with gravity. Comets travel around the sun in elliptical orbits with large eccentricities. If a comet has speed two times 10 to the four meters per second, okay, so 2.0 times 10 to the four meters per second, when at a distance of 
2.5 times 10 to the 11 meters from the center of the sun, what is its speed when at a distance of, we'll call this V1, what is its speed when at a distance of 5.0 times 10 to the 10 meters? So we have a comet going around the sun, right? Some very um, eccentric, some crazy elliptical orbit. And we're given velocity and distance at one point, distance at another point, and asked um, to calculate the velocity. Can we do this for like um, you know some celestial mechanics thing? Calculate the ellipse equations propagated through time. It seems like a pain, right? Is there an easier way? Conservation. Energy. Conservation of energy. Is energy conserved? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, in according to in which system, right? In the system of just the comet. Yes. So the comets. So kinetic energy of the comet plus potential energy of the comet is conserved, you're saying? Well, plus the gravitational potential. Okay. Gravitational potential energy, yeah. right? That's all we need to know about the system? They already agree with that? For the purposes of this problem, that's true. But let's think for a moment about how an actual comet works, right? Why does a comet have a tail? It's getting blasted by the sun, right? The tail is the debris of the comet getting blasted by the sun. Um, so what does that mean about the comet? It means it's losing mass, right? As it gets closer and closer to the sun, it's uh, both heating up, it's absorbing energy, and it's losing mass. So it's not completely accurate to say that it's a, a closed system in that sense. But for the purposes of this problem, I think we can assume that. OK, so we know the initial kinetic energy, right? So it's just 1 half mv squared. We're not told this comet is spinning or anything, so we don't have to worry about that. Um, how do we write the gravitational potential energy? Can I do this? <laughs> no? I've been doing that for weeks. What's wrong with that one? What's wrong with this one? G Yeah, G is not, you're not on the surface of the Earth, right? Yeah. Comet on the surface of the Earth, we'd have bigger problems than getting this physics, physics wrong. Okay, so. I have to do this one, right? right? So this is V1, and this is R1. It's supposed to be a squared minus GMN over R2, right? And here we're assuming that this doesn't change, the mass notice here doesn't change. If you did have information about how the mass changed, you could actually incorporate that here, right? Think of M1 and M2. Assuming the mass of the sun doesn't change, right? And then you just, you're interested in this one, right? And so you can just solve for it. So V2 squared is V1 squared plus 2 GM. Because this mass cancels because it's all the same term everywhere. Right? And so this is exactly what we're given. And so we can calculate it. Is this a reasonable speed for the uh, velocity of the comet? Yes? Well, how can we estimate it? Like, um, it's, it's 10 to the 11 meters from the sun. Its velocity is you know, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 meters. How long is that going to take to, uh, to get from the sun to, the, to, go to, to make one orbit, approximately? Order of magnitude. I mean, if you're just doing orders of magnitude, you know that over a fairly large change of distance, velocity doesn't change that much. It's going to be you know, 10 to 5 seconds. And how many seconds are in a year? A lot. 
How many knows how many seconds are in a year? Or magnitude, seconds in a year? 10 to the 10, 10 to the 2. What's that? Sorry? Yeah. Number of seconds in a year is about the pi times 10 to the 7. Okay? That's a good way to remember. So this suggests it's going to take less than a year. Is that reasonable? What's the, what's the period of a comet? It can be hundreds of years or thousands of years, right? But, you know, we're just doing rough order magnitude, so it doesn't matter. So, yeah, this could be reasonable. Okay. Let's do another problem. Okay. This one's back to um, uh, rotation. Are there any questions about this one? Okay. So here's some mechanism used to raise a crate of supplies. So you have a box and a rope, and the rope is wrapped around some cylinder like this, right? And then a tad the cylinder is a handle, and the handle is like this. The mechanism shown in this figure is used to raise a crate of supplies from a ship's hold. So this is like. Some ships hold. The crate has mass 50 kilograms. A rope is wrapped around a wooden cylinder that turns on a metal axle. The cylinder has radius 0 0.25 meters. So this is 0 0.25 meters. And moment of inertia of blah, 2.9 kilogram meters squared. The crate is suspended from the free end of the rope. One end of the axle pivots on frictionless bearings. A crank, crank handle is attached to the other end. When the handle is turned, turn, the end of the handle rotates about an axle vertical circle of radius 0 0.12 meters. Now the cylinder is turned and the crate is raised. Question, what is the magnitude of the force F applied tangentially to the handle, so you, turn, you put some force here, in order to raise the crate with the acceleration 1.40 meters per second squared? Okay, so you apply some force here that turns this, which turns this, which pulls on the rope, which lifts the crate. And we want to know how quickly, what force we have to apply here so that the crate is raised at this acceleration. Okay? So how do we approach this one? Free body diagram. Free body diagram. Good, knee jerk answer. Free body diagram for what? For the crate. All right, so let's start with the crate. What forces are on the crate? Gravity, right? And tension from the rope, right? And what do we know about the sum of the forces here? Is it zero? No, no. Hope not, right? Sum of the forces is MA, right? Where we're given what A is, right? And this is MG, I guess it should be T minus MG. Get the signs right. T minus MG, right? So we know what the mass is, 50 kilograms. We know G. Um, we actually even know A. So we can solve directly for T, right? Eliminate all this. T is equal to mg plus A, right? You have to overcome gravity and supply that acceleration. Um, so if you plug in the numbers, you get 560 newtons. Okay, so basically we don't care what it is we're lifting anymore, we just know that this tension here has to be 560 newtons. Okay, so let's do a free body diagram for the um, cylinder, right? Cylinder looks like this. We have a uh, tension down. What else do we have for the cylinder? Whatever's supporting it and its weight, but we can just assume that all balances out because the cylinder's not going anywhere. Yeah, well, there's a force up from whatever's supporting it. Yeah, which is balanced by the, the weight of the cylinder or whatever. 
Uh, so what else? The applied force, right? If it rotates here, the applied force is some distance from that, right? It's like this. Okay, anything else? Those are all the relevant forces. Okay, so um, <clears throat> how do we how do we deal with these rotational forces and connect them to what we know that we need for the tension here? <coughs> Well, how do we relate the torque to the acceleration? Uh, well, you can, uh, since you assume uh, that the system is, I guess, in equilibrium here, the constant acceleration, uh, you set the torque equal to Constant that. acceleration uh, equilibrium? I mean, sorry, not equilibrium, but the constant acceleration. Right. So, uh, set the forces equal, no, the opposite. No, but you can say something about the sum of the torque, right? The sum of the torque is equal to what? Is I, which we're conveniently given, times alpha, right? Alpha is the rotational acceleration, right? And we can also say specifically what the sum of the torques are, right? Let's just add up the torques. So this is F times L, right? This is our length here minus T times R, right? or R is the radius of this guy. These two things act to oppose each other. Hopefully this one's larger than this one, so you're getting a positive angular acceleration, right? Now, um, we can relate this alpha here because we know the rope goes without slipping, so this is I A over R, right? So now we have an equation that get, this is the thing we're trying to figure out, right? We're trying to figure out what the force is. We know what the tension is. We know this length. We know this r. We're given this a. Sorry, we're given this i, a, and r, right? So we have everything we need. We just need to solve for the force now. So we can say FL is i, a over r plus tr, right? So therefore, F is IA over RL plus TR over L. And we have everything we need there. You plug it in, and you get, I got 1,300 newtons. OK, so the key thing here is recognizing that we're interested in the rotational motion of this guy. It's just like thinking about the translation of motion, right? The sum of the torques and equate those to the acceleration. We know what acceleration we need because the cylinder has to rotate the same velocity, the same angular acceleration as the, as the rope, right? And we know something about the components of the torque, and one of them is the one we're specifically interested in. Question? Okay, let's do another one. Okay. All right, this is a crazy one. This one says a 1,500 kilogram rocket is to be launched with an upward speed of 50 meters per second. To assist its engines, it will start from rest on a ramp that rises 53 degrees above the horizontal. Yeah. So we have a rocket here, 53 degrees above the horizontal, 53 degrees. At the bottom, the ramp turns upwards and launches the rocket vertically. Okay. So the rocket slides down and then gets shot up, right? The engines provide a constant forward thrust of 2,000 newtons. Okay, so force from the engine is 2,000 newtons. But there is friction on the ramp of 500 newtons. Okay. 
how far from the base of the ramp should the rocket start as measured along the surface of the ramp? Okay, so we want to achieve V launch of, what did they say, 50.0 meters per second. Okay. So what kind of problem does this one look like? It looks like an energy problem, right? It's got a one or two little wrinkles, which is that instead of just sliding down a hill, there's friction. And in addition, this thing is engines turn on when it's on the ramp, right? Not just when it's uh, going up. So how do we deal with that? Well, we have initial kinetic energy, initial gravitational energy, work done by other, uh, other forces is kinetic energy plus potential energy. This is going to allow us to connect the velocity, which is what we want. Right? So we say potential energy is zero at the end. This one is just one half m v launch squared, right? Um, this guy is zero. Starts off at rest. This potential energy is easy, m g h, right? We're gonna have to be careful because it's interesting that we're asked for distance along the ramp, right? D, but the potential energy depends only on H. But of course we have this angle, so we're leaving them won't be too hard. Okay, so this is the potential energy. What about this guy? How do we write this? Force times distance, okay. So with force. 2,000 minus 500, right? 1,500 times the distance. Why is it 2,000 minus 500? Well, the engine is basically acting like opposite friction, right? I mean, the engine is there to overcome friction, to compensate for it and to give you a little extra boost. So you can think of it, if you put it in exactly the same category as you do friction, except it just overcomes it. Does everybody understand how we, how we got here? Right? So this is the hard part of the problem. Right, recognizing it's an energy problem and figuring out how to incorporate that information into our conservation of energy. The rest of it is just going to be a little bit of math. Right? Um, so we're interested in the answer in terms of D, so we should take H and write it as MGD sine theta, right? plus 1500d is equal to one half mv squared. All right now we have an equation that has only that where the only thing we don't know is d. All right. So d is one half mv squared over mg sine theta plus 1500. Right. Okay, and I get 142 meters. Is the mass given? Is the mass given? Yes, thank you. A 1500 kilogram rocket. Good question, thank you. So another problem, easily solved with energy methods, as long as you think about how to set it up. Okay. Next one. A seven kilogram shell at rest explodes into two fragments, one with a mass of two kilograms and the other with a mass of five kilograms. So we have some object explodes into two pieces, one two kilograms, one five kilograms. If the heavier fragment gains 100 joules of kinetic energy from the explosion, right? So let's see, let's call this one um, A and B. So kinetic energy A is 100 joules. If the heavier fragment gains 100 joules of kinetic energy from the explosion, how much kinetic energy does the lighter one gain? The 
heavier one, it says the heavier one gains. Yeah. So, can we use conservation of energy? Not really, because where does the kinetic energy come from? Something that caused the explosion, right? Some dynamite or some like powerful team of hamsters or something inside this object. So, we don't have to know anything about the initial energy, so we can't say anything about the energy in terms of conservation. So what can we say? Momentum, right? Momentum is conserved even if it's inelastic or totally crazy. So what is the initial momentum? Initial momentum is zero, right? All right. So what does that tell us? Well, it, says, it tells us that MBVB plus MAVA is equal to zero, right? And we know the ratio of the masses, so that tells us that VB over VA um, Did I mix that up? No, that looks right. Yes. I mean, these are, these are magnitudes now, right? Because they're going to have opposite signs also. Okay, so, all right, so we learned that the, something about the ratio of the velocities. How does that help us? We use all the information we have. We thought we were on the right path. Are we at a dead end? Okay, so you're saying we can use that to find the kinetic energy, the velocity of this one? So you're saying we can actually find the velocity, right? And then we could use that to find the velocity of the other one and then find the kinetic energy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you could also, that's a totally reasonable answer. You can also skip a step by saying, well, all I know is this ratio, then uh, KB over KA is 1 half MBVB squared over 1 half MABA squared, right? The halves cancel, and this is MB over MA times VB over VA squared, right? VB over VA squared is MA over MB, right? So this becomes MB MA squared over MA MB squared, MA over MB, right? So now we have the ratio of the kinetic energies. And we know one of the kinetic energies, right? So the kinetic energy ratio is the ratio of the masses, right? So that tells us that KB is MA over MB times KA. So that's 250 joules. But you can also, also actually solve for the value of the velocity. OK, so conservation momentum is your friend. OK, here's another one from chapter 9. A thin light wire is wrapped around the rim of a wheel. So here we have a wheel. And a wire wrapped around it, attached to a mass, of course. The wheel rotates around a stationary horizontal axis that passes through the center of the wheel. The wheel has radius 0 0.18 meters. 0 0.18 meters. And a moment of inertia of 0 0.48 kilogram meters squared. A small block with mass 0 0.34 kilograms is suspended from the free end of the wire. When the system is released from rest, 
The block descends with constant acceleration. The bearings in the wheel and the axle are rusty. Uh-oh, this got interesting. Uh, rusty, so friction there does negative six joules of work as the block descends three meters. Okay, so we're going down three meters and the work due to friction is negative six joules. Interesting. What is the magnitude of the angular velocity of the wheel? Okay, so we're being asked what is omega of the wheel after the block has descended three meters. All right, so we're after omega of the wheel. Well, the fact that they tell you this friction and they give you the friction only in terms of the work that the friction does over three meters means that there's really no way to solve this problem other than just using energy, right? We have potential energy of the you know, potential energy of this guy, and then it moves down here, it loses six joules of energy, um, and it loses potential energy and gains kinetic energy. So we just gotta balance all of those things. And it seems like we're given all the information. We know uh, the moment of inertia of this guy. Notice they gave us the moment of inertia because we might be concerned that it's some complex object since it obviously has friction inside it. So they can put those, those concerns to rest by just giving us the moment of inertia. Okay, so K1 plus U1 plus W equals K2 plus U2, right? And we can say this one's zero, um, this one's zero, right? Um, potential energy here is just going to be MGH, right? And minus six joules, we're told. And then how do we write the kinetic energy? Well, we could do one half mv squared, where v is for the block. And what else? Also need the rotational kinetic energy of this wheel, right? Not only does the wheel burn energy in terms of friction, it absorbs energy into its rotation, right? That's one half i omega squared, okay? So we're interested in this omega. Now we have this mass, we know this, we have this mass, we don't know v squared, right? So we have one equation and two unknowns. So what do we do? Right. We say V is equal to R omega because the two are connected. The reason the wheel is spinning is because the rope is connected to it. So we can use that fact. We know there's a connection between how fast the block is falling and how quickly the wheel is spinning. And that connection is exactly this. Right? So this means and usually we take omega and we turn it into v because we're interested in v. But here we're interested in omega. So we can take this v and replace it and say this is 1 half m r squared omega squared, right, plus whatever. So this whole term is 1 half um, let's see, yeah, m r squared plus i uh, times omega squared, all right? Now this is interesting because if you think about what, what, was, what is the moment of inertia of this block? Well, it's basically like mr squared, right? Because it's connected to the wheel here at radius r. So it's sort of like another way to think about this problem is in just term, in terms of rotation, there's the rotation of the wheel and the rotation of the block, right? I, I just like recognizing those connections. Um, is equal to mgh, and the question was, yeah, what is omega? And now we have everything we need to know. We have an equation with only one thing in it, right? So omega squared is 2 mgh minus 12 joules over mr squared plus i. Right. And so omega is square root of this monster, which gives you 4.03 radians per second. Is there any other way to solve this problem? I don't think so, because of the way they gave us the information 
because it forces us to use energy. Questions? November 2003, the most distant known object in the solar system was discovered by observation with a telescope. This object, known as Sedna, is approximately 1,700 kilometers in diameter. 1,700 kilometers in diameter. Uh, it takes 10,500 years to orbit the sun. 10,500 years to orbit the sun. It reaches a maximum speed of 4.64 kilometers per second. Wow, that is slow. 4.64, oh no, kilometers per second. Sorry, I was reading meters per second. <laughs> Still slow, though, for a celestial object. Calculations of its complete path, based on several measurements, indicate that its orbit is highly elliptical, varying from 76 AU to 942 AU. What's an AU? Right. Distance from the Earth to the Sun. Um, AU is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilometers. Question, what is Sedna's minimum speed? Okay, so this is the maximum speed. So at, uh, this is its maximum speed. Here's its minimum distance and maximum distance, and various other information. Question is, um, what is Sedna's maximum speed? Conservation of energy, like that first problem. We could do conservation of energy, um, and then you would have. Um, You'd have the gravitational potential energy and the velocity, right? Um, is there another way to solve this problem? We're looking for the, so this is its maximum speed. The question is, what is its minimum speed? So first of all, when is the minimum speed going to occur? The largest distance, right? So when it's closest to the sun, it's going to be going um, this fast. When it's farthest from the sun, it's going to be going uh, its minimum speed. Uh, yeah, potentially you could use some celestial mechanic stuff. I can never remember those things. And they're not generally very applicable. What else? What about angular momentum? What's D? Sorry? What's D? Uh, that's its, uh, its diameter. This is the diameter of the thing. This is how long it takes to, to, to I think that's just for information for the interested. What about angular momentum? Is angular momentum conserved? Yeah. All right, so angular momentum is what? Velocity times the mass times the distance, right? So if this is conserved, right, then, M1, then V1 L1 is V2 M L2, right? And so if this, if we call V, this is a V1, so the maximum speed is at the minimum distance, so this is L1, this is L2, and we're interested in V2, so V2 is L1 over L2 times V1, right? So this is going to be 76 over 942 times 4.64 kilometers per second equals 0 0.374 kilometers per second. That's its minimum speed. 
Okay, so the easiest way to do that one is the angle of the moon. Then it says, yeah, what points in its orbit do the maximum minimum speeds occur? We already got that. Then it says, what is the ratio of Sedna's maximum kinetic energy to its minimum kinetic energy? Well, we know the relationship of the velocities, right? And so the ratio of the kinetic energies, K1 over K2, is 1 half mv1 squared over 1 half mv2 squared is v1 over v2 quantity squared. And we know the relationship of velocities here, and so that's easy. Okay. And how many boards are we going to fill up today? Seriously, lecturing is going to improve my tennis game. Bulk up my right arm. Here's a rotational one. A thin uniform rod has a length of 0.5 meters and is rotating in a circle on a frictionless table. Okay. So we have a table, and a rod. The axis of rotation is perpendicular to the length of the rod at one end and it's stationary. So it's rotating like this. All right, this is our rod. The rod has an angular velocity of 0.4 radians per second. 0.4 radians per second. And a moment of inertia of 3 times 10 to the negative 3 kilogram meters squared. OK. And a length of 0.5 meters. Okay, so the rod is at the table, rotating around one end, it's a half a meter long. A bug, initially standing on the rod at the axis of rotation, decides to crawl out to the other end of the rod. When the bug has reached the end of the rod and sits there, so here we have a bug, reached the end of the rod and sits there, it's tangential speed, the bug, is 0 0.16 meters per second. Okay. The bug can be treated as a point mass. A, what is the mass of the rod? B, what is the mass of the bug? Okay. A, we're looking for mass of the rod. Do we need the information about the bug to get the mass of the rod? Well, what's the moment of inertia of a, um, of a rod like this? Man, you guys actually memorize this stuff? Yes. Yes? Okay. Your brains must be like uh, vastly empty and have room for all this stuff. <laughs> I put some piece of information like this in, something else falls out. You just download the You have your brain computer interface? You just, yeah. That's nice. You're in the matrix, that's great. Am I in your matrix or you in my matrix? I don't have my inside in total with me, so I can't. <laughs> All right, so here we have a relationship between moment of inertia, the mass, and the length, right? We're given moment of inertia and the length, and we're asked for the mass. So this is a very easy problem, right? So this is 3i over l squared. <coughs> Um, which is 0 0.0360 kilograms. Okay, that part was easy. Now it says, what is the mass of the bug? What is the mass of the bug? Conservation of angular momentum, right? Go with what we know. So, 
How do we use conservation of angular momentum? Well, let's write angular momentum as I omega, right? Because we are we have the information about the moment of inertia. So I one omega one is I two omega two. Okay, that's going well so far because we know I one, we know omega one, right? We just call this I. Um, now we don't know I two and we don't know omega two, and we're being asked. What is the mass of the bug? So how do we write this moment of inertia here? I plus the contribution from the bug, right? Which is m bug l squared. Why can you just add the moment of inertia together? Moment of inertia is the sum over all the little objects inside an object, all the little parts inside an object. So you add a new object to it, you could just Add more, add more pieces, right? So it's trivial to get the moment of inertia of two things stuck together, you just add them. As long as it's about the same axis, right? Always has to be about the same axis. So this is the moment of inertia of the rod with the bug on it. And what about W2? What do we do there? <coughs> well, W2 is V over L, right? The bug is on the rod, so it's gonna have the same angular velocity as the rod. Right? And, we're interested, and we're told this one, so we might as well uh, write this down in terms of things we know. Right? So this is V over L. V over L. Okay, so then how are we doing? We have an equation where we know this, we know this. Yeah, we know this, we're looking for this, and we know this, and we're giving this and this. So we have everything we need, right? Just saying conservation of angular momentum and writing down, trying to write down that expression is giving us all the information we need. We end up with one equation and one unknown. Right? So you can rearrange it, which I'm incapable of on a chalkboard. And so I did in advance 3 times 10 to the minus 3 kilograms. Right? So the key here is you're using angular conservation of angular momentum and you know how to make the moment of inertia of a new hybrid object from the two pieces it's made of. Okay. <coughs> okay. Here's a really hard one. Two uniform marbles, two centimeters diameter, are stacked in a container. Okay. One perfectly circular marble, second perfectly circular marble. Okay. Two marbles, 75 grams each. 75 grams. Um, radius is one centimeter. Are stacked in this container. The, uh, the container is three centimeters wide. Okay, so this is one centimeter, this is one centimeter, uh, that's one centimeter. So they overlap a little bit. Right, there's not enough room for them to settle next to each other because that would require four centimeters. Find the force that the container exerts on the marbles at the points of contact A, B, and C. Equilibrium, all right. So equilibrium means the sum of the forces and the sum of the torques is zero, right? Nothing's moving, so certainly in equilibrium. How do we use that information? Well, let's figure out what all the forces are on each object. Sum them all up, add them to zero, and see if we can write down enough constraints to solve the system of equations, right? So let's think about what are the forces, okay? I'm gonna have to draw this bigger. Okay, so first one is two thirds wide. This one's two thirds wide. Okay. So what are the forces? So there's some. This is a. The sum force here. That's what we're looking for, right? The sum force here that we want to know. We're told there's a force here, right? What other forces are there? Normal force between the marbles, right? 
So, like this. What else? What about the weight, right? Anything else? I'm sorry? Atmospheric pressure? Force of personality? Um, okay. So let's think about it in terms of components. Um, in terms of components, um, what are the vertical components? So there's two weights down, right? So the for this force B is up. Minus two weights. Is that right? What about these guys? Yeah, I could include them, but they just cancel each other out, right? So it doesn't matter. They're, or they're internal. That's a good way of thinking about it. Um, OK, so that's pretty simple. Um, in fact, we know the weight of the marble. Right? We're given the mass of each marble, 75 grams, radius is one centimeter. So we already know what B is, right? That wasn't too hard. What about in the X direction? Where are the forces in X? A and C, right? OK, but that's useful <laughs> if we knew A or C, but we know neither. So, and now we've run out of dimensions. <laughs> so what can we do? Sorry? Okay. Look at one of the marbles, so which one? Top marble? Yeah. Okay. And do what? Do we know the angle between them? Let's see. Well, we know, let's, do, let's draw a triangle, right? This is, this is 2R, right? This is R, right? Because it's, the whole container is 3R wide, right? And so this one has to be 30 degrees. Probably uh, lots of ways to do it. Um, easiest way, or the shortest way, um, is to think about the torque. Because remember, we, we've used up our dimensions, but we haven't used up torque. We also require that there's no net torque on the system because it's not spinning. Right? So, how does that help us? Well, uh, net torque is equal to zero, right? Um, so, talk about which point is the question, right? The center of the bottom marble. Center of the bottom marble. Isn't so like the top one rotates around it. We want to involve. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, torque around this point, right? And what two forces are going to have torque there? Just these two, right? So, this is going to give us. times R, and that's going to be balanced by FC times this distance, right, which is 2R. 
and then we need the sine of the angle, right? So this, uh, this torque equation lets us solve for Fc, because we know everything else in here, right? And then from Fc, we can get Fa. So don't forget that um, equilibrium also means no net torque. W, sorry. Yeah, W line. Because the force is the weight. Right? The torque is about here, though. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay? Okay, I think that's probably enough problem for today. Um, so have a good Thanksgiving, and I will see you on Tuesday. Remember to read through, do a bunch of practice problems, send me a request, and next Thursday I will do any problems you request. Do we have a quiz tomorrow?